All right, guys, super excited to dive into this week's episode and talk about our takeaways on what effectively would be a hard look at grit and the freelance, the gig economy. And uh, to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well. Yeah, what's going on in your world? Well, I went back to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles Ooh. for the Uninitiated. <laughs> this, this never ends well. <laughs> it doesn't start well either. <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was in the airport uh, on one of our trips that we were on recently, and and I noticed that the, in the Richmond airport, they were saying that it would be in my best interest to update my driver's license. Virginia, a commonwealth, is, uh, <laughs> yes, we're not a state, we're a commonwealth, is uh, saying that we need to update our driver's licenses to be compliant with federal guidelines. They're calling this a real ID. I guess I have a fake ID. I'm not sure. In order to get that, it would ne- it would necessitate necessitate. Yep, that's right. Nice. It would necessitate a visit to the Department of Motor Vehicles. So, uh, life was getting very busy, and I ran out of time. And so I just found myself there with my wife and son at four o'clock on a Friday, and what effectively became a three hour wait in the Department of Motor Vehicles. Oh, sounds like a real blast. So, <laughs> yeah, four o'clock on a Friday. That so. is that is one word for it. <laughs> nice. A blast. A real blast. All right. Um, there's two things I want to say is one, don't do that. Come up with a plan. You know, if I had had time on my side and planning on my side, if I had remembered what a nightmare the DMV is, I would have gone through the effort of looking up how to avoid lines at the DMV, which while you cannot skip the DMV, if you're updating to a real ID, you can at least take a little bit of thought and put into when are the lines at least moderate to lower, right? When are they not crazy? Uh, in my case, they were crazy. And so I went ahead, Brad, if you want, I went ahead just and scooped up what the DMV markets as the best times to go in the DMV so that you don't have to be at DMV with your wife, who's 36 plus weeks pregnant, and your two and a half year old son, who has an attention span that is about 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Hopefully, this is broadly applicable to people outside of our lovely Commonwealth, I'm assuming. I think it is, because I think at its core, it's based on human nature. Okay, fair All enough. right. So, when not to go to the DMV when I was there? Uh, uh, but more, but 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 at a more granular level, don't go on the weekends. Don't go right before or right after a holiday. Don't go at lunchtime. Don't go when the DMV opens or right before they close. Don't go during the first week of the month or the last week of the month. Man, that's a that's really right. a lot of that's that pretty stringent, right? <laughs> now, there's a why for all of this, but at its heart, it's because you're going to be in a three-hour line. So, when should you go instead? You're throwing a dart at the wall and you have to go get your ID updated or whatever. When should you go? Highly recommended to go during the middle of the week. This is going to be oddly specific, but it's based on a traffic data. Middle of the week, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or a Thursday. Don't go, don't go before holiday, and don't go earlier than a week after a holiday. That's a mouth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go an hour before or an hour after the lunch rush. So don't think that you can go during your lunch break and it's going to be okay. It's simply not. And now. <laughs> And and at the heart of this, also generally the middle of the month. Man, that is like that's a gauntlet. And if you can thread that needle, maybe maybe you'll recover an hour of your life. Wow. <laughs> All right, I think my brain just shut down listening to you. Honestly, can, can we but, get an infographic made for that? Yeah, really. Uh, I mean, I guess the, some of those are broadly applicable to other organization right like if you go to the post office same deal right if you're going right before or after a holiday it's probably not the ideal time but i think this actually goes back to something we talked about what maybe a year or 18 months ago about what are some ways that you can claw back time by following the path to financial independence right and we talked about not going grocery shopping on a saturday at 2 p.m so having some flexibility in your schedule gives you an ability to reclaim time that you otherwise would just lose as a matter of course, right? So for some people, going during their lunch hour might be the only option. But if you have some flexibility, and certainly if you're at Phi or or thereabouts, you have the option to spend your time as you see fit. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. So while this is just one funny little Jonathan anecdote story, it's a broadly applicable topic for Phi generally of you get to spend your 168 hours a week how you choose. 
Yeah, I mean, as you said, Brad, you can apply this to your grocery store shopping. You could apply this to a trip to Disney. You could apply this to anything that you want to take. If you have flexibility in your life where you can go anytime, why would you go when everyone else is going? We use this now on like Valentine's Day or Mother's Day. Like we do, we could arbitrarily pick the day that the society has handed us, or we can have the exact same experience on one side or the other and have the restaurant basically to ourselves. Um. <laughs> you know, it's funny, actually. I heard a friend of mine, I think at our at our pool mentioned that they actually switched the dates for Mother's Day and Father's Day because on Mother's Day if you treat it as if it were Father's Day you can go golfing and just waltz in and you don't have to wait for hours and hours and vice versa for the places that are super popular on the traditional Mother's Day are not quite as popular on Father's Day so it's just kind of a cool little rethink of like you said just maybe go follow what society says kind of but then just switch it a little bit just to optimize so i just thought that was kind of a, a cool little rethink on it nice art of the pivot yeah all right brad let's go ahead and switch gears and i want to talk about sunny burn's story and in particular how he got to 88.9 percent financially independent <laughs> 88.92 come on jonathan you're shortchanging <laughs> the hundredth decimal yes <laughs> Uh, this gives the guy is acutely aware of the numbers and by looking for kind of these outlier points throughout his life has been able to get incredible results in a, in a very, very short time period. Brad, where, you know, in, in terms of our effectively, if you're thinking about this, this Friday roundup, a summation of what we came away with, what to you stood out the most? Oh, the most. That's hard. I mean, Sonny has a really interesting story. I mean, I guess we'll start with the car flipping business. Yes. Right? Yes. He started this while he was in college. He bought 19, he's owned 19 cars in his life. He sold 17 of them and he just went to work, right? He said his dad, his dad told him he wasn't going to pay for college and Sonny had to figure it out. So I like how he was able to do this for just such a tiny little amount, right? What did he buy? The first car he bought for $1,400. This is arbitrage at its essence, right? Like he noticed an inefficiency in the market and he went for it. And like you said, he worked at Taco Bell. I love it. This is maybe the most interesting part of this. The guy worked at Taco Bell for six months to, as he said, raise the capital to buy his first $1,400 car. I don't think I've ever heard of anybody raising $1,400 as raising capital, but, <laughs> but it's a cool way of thinking about it. It shows how serious this kid was, right? From the very first, he's raising capital for this car flipping business. And he owned that first car for 12 days and doubled his money more than he said he sold it for 2850 bought it for 1400 that's pretty amazing yeah, it really is. And honestly, when he uh, when he was talking about that, so in context, I think I, I was kind of adding up the cars I've had because I've never made money on a vehicle like ever. They've always been how how can I minimize my loss? And in some cases, I've I've bled money on cars. <laughs> it's actually painful to think about. I try to block it out, but for the sake of this conversation, we'll we'll circle back to it. I've never made money on vehicles, and when I was thinking about that. There was a there was a podcast actually that I listened to for a brief period of time that highlights basically the strategy that I heard Sonny talk about. And while I didn't take action on it, clearly someone else did take action on those concepts. I looked it up to see if the podcast is still there. And it is called the three hour car flip oh my podcast. god jonathan i'm having like a flashback you told me about this in early 2017 i thought this was one of those like insane jonathan ideas and a lot of I insane kind, jonathan kind of ideas. slow played it and, <laughs> but I, I fear it's coming back it's not coming back <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to talk about it and we're going to send a bunch of traffic to this podcast yeah. i mean this podcast is going to blow up this week because we're going to promote this thing because it works. It does work. Just because I didn't do it doesn't mean it doesn't work. There's plenty of things that we know work and we don't take action on. And I tell you, in these early days when you're seeing, well, what else can I do? And you're looking on something that you can do immediately. What if you could listen to 10 episodes? This podcast, there are only 10 episodes of this podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what additional projects he's working on, but apparently the entire skill set of flipping cars in a relatively short period can be learned in about 10 episodes. And Sonny did this. What I heard Sonny talk about was exactly the TLDR of what these the information that these episodes encompassed. And I'm just thinking, like, if you have this mindset early on, which I didn't at Sonny's age, like, and even before in his teens, I did not possess this mindset. I was not looking at raising capital for my first venture. Um, I was looking at just time for money type situations, my first entry level job. But if you can have that sort of entrepreneurial spirit at 
at a younger age in your teens, early 20s, you can find inefficiencies in the market, you can always generate income. And, and while we're talking about cars in this particular scenario, there is so much in the secondary market. There is so much margin there that there are hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, I say hundred thousand just to keep it close to accuracy since I don't have data here, people that are generating significant income for themselves by looking for these types of outliers and then creating a system around it. Yeah, I know one thing that jumps to mind here is Amazon FBA. I mean, plenty of people are doing this where they're basically just shopping for products that may be on sale at their local their local store or, I don't know, bargain outlet or dollar store or whatever it may be. They're trying to find inefficiencies. Like you said, this is exactly it. And by using the reach of Amazon, they're able to resell it and just make a profit, even if it's a small profit per item. If you can find these items, if you can source them, and I think that's that's the word I always hear is source, right? That's the difficult part, but man, if you can find those products and you can find these markets, you can make a significant amount of money. So, I mean, that's just one small example, but I know obviously many tens of thousands of people are doing that Amazon FBA arbitrage, but yeah, can you think of any other options off the top of your head? So glad you asked. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you never know. I was trying to sandbag you. I was hoping for it. No, Brad, I can't. I cannot be sandbagged. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I actually would like to promote someone in our uh, local community here in Richmond, Virginia. She doesn't know I'm about to do this, but she actually has helped me personally with the secondary market. Her name is Rachel Ray. She is the Rachel Ray, might I add, the <laughs> Rachel Ray here in Richmond, Virginia. And... Uh, what she did, kind of similar to what Sunny did with uh, what Sunny did with cars, she identified clothing as being a massive secondary market. People are hem like in a world of declutter where everybody feels like they need to go Marie Kondo their closet. What happens to those clothes? Where are they going? So she has never lost money on clothes. In fact, she makes tens of thousands of dollars a year on the clothing she purchases. I mean, she gets paid to wear clothes basically at this particular point in time. And what she does is she finds individuals that are looking to declutter their closet and don't know what to do with it and are considering go ahead and take just dropping it off at a Goodwill or something else, but are looking for maybe a more efficient way of earning some income. And she basically takes their clothing, helps them sort through what they're getting rid of and says, this has resale value, this doesn't, sells it for them, and then after she has completed the collection, will send them a check for half the profits. Hmm. So you're able to, in one fell swoop, have someone come through and tell you of everything that you have, this is what would have, and she just has an eye for it that's been curated over time. And then she's able to take that and generate a business for herself. And it's become so successful and she's scaled it to some varying degree because she's built a system for this that now her entire family is now helping her with this endeavor and it's increasingly becoming a full-time thing. And, and her words to me were, I don't understand why people pay money for clothes at this point. Like, like <laughs> how do you lose money in clothes? I, you know, objectively now people tell me that I have a better style than anybody around me. And at this point, all my clothes are, are nearly free or by the time I'm finished with them and done with them, I sell them for more than I purchased for them. So there's line items in all of our budgets that we just assume are just like, well, you have to have a certain amount for clothes each month and you got to have this, this, and it just keeps scaling up. But other people realize that the secondary market is an incredibly powerful vehicle. And so I think, you know, from a story arc perspective, talking about the three-hour car flip really wasn't the goal for this particular episode. But in context, talking about the secondary market generally as a strategy for people that are looking to focus on the earn more side of the equation or effectively earn more while other, while other people are just trying to spend less could be a viable tactic and something that we should be circling back to. And I tell you what, I could even ask Rachel if she wants to join us on the show. I'm sure she could come in the studio and we could have her on for a Friday roundup this fall. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'd love to chat with her. And what's cool is you can always look at a problem a little bit differently. Like I'm thinking about this business that Rachel has. And I'm wondering if she can almost give away her service for free. Right. Like I'll come in. I'm whatever, you know, organizational or Marie Kondo certified or whatever it may be. And obviously I'm just kind of making this up on the fly here. I'll do that entire service for free and I'll dispose of your your items. Right. And then she can sell these things on the secondary market. Like, obviously, this is all above board because that would be part of part of the way you went about it. But like people just want to get rid of stuff. You talk about what's the hardest part about a business It's usually getting in the door. It's top of the funnel. Right. And if she could give away that service for free, I'm thinking about how like I looked at my problem a little bit differently when I had my original website, Richmond Savers, which was people aren't going to pay me to be a travel rewards coach. But if I gave that service away for free and provided them value, 
then they're going to use whatever affiliate links I may have or some such, and I make money on the back end of this. So again, just kind of applying my own experience to something, and I don't know if this would work at all, but I think the real key is just using your own experience, synthesizing the information you've taken in in your life, and looking at problems a little bit differently. So yeah, who knows? But anyway, would love to chat with Rachel for sure. And you know what, Brad, I love that you brought up Amazon FBA earlier because, you know, actually the, when we recorded this episode with Sonny a month or so ago, uh, the example that we used in that episode was how he found an Amazon FBA opportunity. All right, Brad, I'm going to go and set up that segment for us right now. All right, guys, now I told you we were bringing Sonny back on the show to uh, talk to us a little bit more about uh, how he was able to fund a Roth IRA for his zero-year-old child, and then also how he was able to uh, generate $30,000 in sales on Amazon selling pacifiers, of all things. So uh, yeah, there's so much more here. Sonny, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's start with the Roth IRA, right? I mean, Roth IRA for a one-month-old or two-month-old, like, how did you do this? Right. So like I shared in the show, if, if you listen to it, we had rental properties and we had open houses. And at these open houses, we have three bedroom units and we want nice, stable families to stay in them. So what we do is we would bring my son, six months old at the time, and bring him with us to the property. And I talked to my CPA about it and I said, hey, we want to have my son there as a baby model to kind of showcase to parents, you know, this is a great place for families. You know, imagine your family being there. So we had him there for two weekends of open houses and two weekdays, and we were able to pay him, start his Roth IRA. It was only a couple hundred dollars that first year, but we've since gave him also baby modeling money for my blog. I have his picture on every single one of my blog posts, so I'm able to pay him a little money through my uh, blog LLC and give him a 1099 MISC and pay him a little bit that way. And, you know, now it's he's four years old, but it's accumulated to $3,000 in his Vanguard Roth IRA. So we just hit $3,000. So I was excited to buy VT Sachs. And so he has his S&P 500. And, you know, it's, I just calculated this morning just because I, I wanted to find out. But $3,000, 60 years from now, you know, that's going to be worth $300,000 at an 8% return. $300,000, he's going to be set, you know, at age 64, he's going to have $300,000 in there. And that's tax free. So you can take that out, do whatever he wants with it. And I just think that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, by not having Anna and Molly on every Friday roundup, you are robbing your kids of the opportunity to have $500,000. She could purchase a <laughs> national park with that money. <laughs> All right, wait. Oh, I did want to mention we do. We do also have him help out with the rental property. So we have coin operated laundry machines at each the four family house and the three family house. So he actually takes the quarters and he puts them into those little coin sleeves. So we pay him a, a quarter every time he does that too. So he helps out that way. Brad, how happen here with the accountant questions? Like what are the questions that as an yeah. accountant you would want to have answered in order to make this feel legit? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, Sonny, first for the audience, just explain that this does need to be earned income. In order to put money into the Roth IRA, it has to be earned income, correct? That is correct. Yes. And obviously it has to be legit. I mean, clearly that that's where you're talking about here. You're talking about paying this through your LLC, though it doesn't have to be an LLC, but uh, they're actually getting a 1099. So, I mean, you're dotting I's and crossing T's, but right. talk me through like the actual amount of payment and how you decide whether that's reasonable. But clearly if you paid your son $400 an hour to take coins out of a coin machine, that's not really going to hold up. How do you determine what you pay for the modeling? And do you have contracts? Like, I mean, I know it sounds like a little excessive, but you're an engineer, you're dotting I's and crossing T's. Talk us through what, what you're doing. Right. So that, that the first idea, you know, I talked to my CPA is like, hey, we're going to have these rental house openings. I'm planning to pay my son. You know, I was looking at what baby models kind of go for. And I was like, I'm planning to pay him $100 an hour for every hour he's at this rental property. He said, everything's fine. Just tally it all up and make sure you're tracking every hour. So I would put down the dates. I put out down the hours he was in and the hours he was out. And then he said, you didn't have to do a 1099 miss to pay him. But I just wanted to kind of be clear with everything. So we did, ended up doing a 1099. We ended up doing a tax return for him at zero years of age. We didn't really have to do that, but I just wanted to be very safe and uh, fund the Vanguard IRA. And we do the same thing with the quarters. You know, we pay him a quarter for every time he rolls up a $10 a stack of quarters. And he uses that quarter as his allowance to buy whatever toys he wants at the grocery store or 
things like that. But yeah, we keep very careful, meticulous records and uh, always share that with our CPA. All right. So this is probably obvious to Brad, but like for the layman like me, when you say we keep meticulous records, like what does that actually mean? So like, are you tracking this on Excel? Have you created a paper document trail? Like for an audience member that has no idea even what those terms like 1099 and all these other things actually mean, what would they need to do to replicate this in a manner that would be satisfactory to a CPA? I don't think you have to do the 1099 MISC, but that's just a way to pay contractors. Anytime you pay a contractor over $600, maybe for working for your house, you're supposed to find this one page form. It's actually half a page form and fill out their name and their social security number and how much you paid them that year and then mail it to them. So that's what the 1099 MISC is. But for us, uh, we just keep a little clipboard right by the quarters. And each time we just write down the date and how many quarters he rolled and how much we paid him for something like that. And then for uh, the baby modeling, I'm this a couple of years ago, but I think I just had it on a spreadsheet, just tallied it up. And I assume since this is a business deduction for your LLC, that you're documenting it and keeping it as part of your records, whether you scan it in or keep a paper copy or some such. So, so, I mean, you are holding on to this for, right. for many years in the future, right? Yep. I have a scanned receipt in my uh, files and that as a line item, as an expense. And I think I know the answer to this, but I think it's probably valuable for our audience. It's not a zero sum game, right? The fact that you're paying this out. So that's a deduction. Your business has this, uh, I guess it has income that comes into the business and then you're paying this out as an expense to your child. But then I think this is maybe the question I'm trying to put myself in a listener's shoes. Does your child then have to pay taxes on that, thereby negating whatever benefit or savings that you actually get? How would that actually work out in reality? So perhaps Brad can answer this better than I can. Uh, I did do the calculations a while back. I th- we did have to pay more. You know, there was more payment because uh, we paid him. And then, yeah, we had it as expense, but he had to file a tax return. So we didn't have to do that tax return. I just wanted to do that to be safe, to have Vanguard uh, feel like it was a good investment. So we did pay, you know, the tax return. I had to pay my CPA to file that tax return. I think he charged us $100 to make that fee. I could have done it myself, I guess. But that's what ended up happening. Brad, I don't know if you want to step in. So this is at worst tax neutral. And and I guess it's probably very, very possible. Honestly, guys, like I don't file individual returns. So maybe we should have had my wife, Laura, on to do this. But I mean, it, it's very possible that your son is getting his own standard deduction and there is no tax there. So in which case, again, we're saying at worst it's tax neutral. But best case, you're getting a deduction on your LLC and your son is paying zero in tax because of the standard deduction. So Again, that is right off the top of my head, but I think this is a, a win no matter how we're looking at it. Yeah, you can't beat, you know, 59 years of uh, tax-free growth, that $300,000 gain tax-free that he's going to have access to. How I made my child a trillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have put it into a 529 easily enough, I guess, but with the Roth IRA, I feel like there's just so much more advantages. It doesn't have to be for education. It's not going to be looked down on him if he does apply for financial aid. I don't think the Roth IRA is considered as an asset since it's for retirement. It's not for education like the 529. So there's just so many more advantages going in this route. And we have these you know, unique situations where you have these rental properties and you know, I have my blog where I can use this picture that we were able to pay him for his services. All right. Now, these two separate trains of thought are not connected at all. In fact, I can't even make the bridge other than that at some point (laughs) your son will need pacifiers, but it really isn't tied. You were able to sell $30,000 of pacifiers on Amazon. I'm, I'm curious why and and how like what what what's happening here is this a side hustle how did this come on your radar why why did you guys do this when i was younger i used to buy and sell on ebay but anyway uh going back to the pacifiers when my son was born uh, the hospitals gave us a pacifier and you know my son liked the pacifier we brought him home and he lost the pacifier we couldn't find it anywhere i go to the stores i'm looking for this exact pacifier there's ones that are similar but i could not find this exact hospital pacifier i go online i start googling where do i find this hospital pacifier Everyone, I've seen forums, everyone has the same exact question. I eventually find, stumble on a link with a hundred pack, a hundred case of uh, pacifiers, but I'm like, I don't need a hundred. I just need one to stop my baby from crying. And, you know, I'm putting two and two together. You know, there's this abundant need I'm seeing on the forums. Uh, I have this background selling things on eBay. You know, let me just see, you know, I can supply this need. So I buy a, that hundred pack. I stopped my son from crying, give him a one pacifier, and then I listed on eBay and, you know, it starts selling quickly, quickly. I'm getting tired of going to the post office, mailing out all these pacifiers. 
And, you know, I'd heard about Amazon FBA, which is fulfilled by Amazon, where you can just ship your inventory to Amazon and put it on their Prime website. They make a sale. They ship it out for you. So I no longer have to go to the postal service. And, you know, they start selling really, really well. We, we were selling like 10 a day at this point. Um, I think it went up to like 50,000 in sales last year. But, yeah, it was just a need that we felt. And we were like, hey, let's do something about this. Let's fulfill this need. And, you know, parents have thanked us for it since. All right. This is crazy. So we uh, you're just finding side hustles like you turn left. Oh, side hustle. You turn right. Side <laughs> hustle. It's like, you know, I think people that are like, oh, I don't have any ideas. Like you can't you can't shut them off. Let's talk about the practicalities of this. So you figured out how to scale yourself out. So it just works. So what does that mean in terms of your actual time commitment to continue this? And then question two, your margin, like what is this worth? Okay, let me go through the process. So we ordered, you know, 100 packs of pacifiers. We had to order them like a thousand quantities now just because they sell really quickly. You can buy them on Amazon today. Unfortunately, you know, it's not our own product. We're just reselling a pacifier made by Philips Corporation. So we have competitors now because it was such a hot selling product. So we have to compete with all these other sellers. So it's not doing as well as it was, and it is cutting a little bit in our profits. But it's a really easy business for us because, you know, I'm not mailing these out myself. We just get these bulk pacifiers. I actually have my mom-in-law who lives upstairs label them. She puts on a filled by Amazon label so they can scan at the warehouse and ship it out to the right customer. And like so per, she just- per passy, like one label per pass. I mean, just correct me if I'm wrong. Just wanted to spot check myself here. Or is she putting a sticker on a thousand passies at a time? No, one label per pacifier. Well, we actually have a two pack. So I have a little heat sealer. She puts in a little baggie, heat seals it closed, puts on the label, and I pay her 25 cents for every pack she does. And it's a good, you know, she's retired now, so it's a good uh, side income for us. She's helping us out with the business. It just works. And what is your margin on these? So let's say you have an item that's selling for, what's the listing price? I know it's depending on the competitiveness of the market, but what's the current listing price? So currently it's a two pack of pacifiers for $16. It costs about a dollar fifty a pacifier each. So it's, you know, for a two pack, it's three dollars. And then to ship it to Amazon, I estimate it's around thirteen cents to you know bulk ship to Amazon. And then a fourth of a cent to label, and then a seventh of a cent for a suffocation label we have to put on as well. So net profit, we expect around like eight dollars per sale. Eight dollars per, and you're selling fifteen to twenty a day. Is is that what I heard you say? Yeah, it has. Okay, so it was 15 to 20 a day. It's since kind of decreased because of the competitors. But yeah, we have probably have on average 10 sales a day. This is incredible. So are, have you ever thought about creating your own product? Like, is that something that's in your kind of, oh, this would be fun. Maybe we should just try to scale out and just do it beginning to end ourselves. Is that something that's opened up to you? Right. That's exactly what we want to do. Because if you create your own product with your own label, Vamvestor pacifiers, then competitors can't hop on your listing and start selling them. So you have full control. You get great ratings. So you do a good job and you gain all the profits. You know, I had to create that listing. Actually, that listing has a picture of my son using the pacifier on it and other people are selling on it because it's not my product and I can't control that listing. So I do want to create my own products that's just I don't know. I have too many ideas. So I got to focus on real estate first. And once I'm financially free, I'll focus on these other things. But this is it. I mean, Brad, Brad, I want to, I want to bring you in on this. Like when you create the space in your life that you're no longer trying to figure out how to keep the lights on, this isn't about retirement. It's about having options. Yeah. It's options. And, and yeah, I mean, Sonny, this is a cool one, right? Because you literally found a pain point. And we've talked about that before, Jonathan, with finding side hustles, look for pain points in your life. In this case, it was your son loved this pacifier. So how do I solve that problem? And then you realize there are thousands of other people, tens of thousands of other families that have this same pain point. You can solve that and make money in the process. Like that to me is the perfect side hustle. I love that. Yeah, it's worked out well. Awesome. Sonny, thanks so much for coming on the show. People listening to this that haven't yet heard the Monday episode, what is the best way to connect with you and your content? Right. Just uh, hop on my uh, blog, famvestor.com, where we share about financial independence and creating strong families. Go to my contact page and I have my email there. You can just email me directly. You know, Sonny actually reminds me of Ed, who works with us here at Choose FI that we've talked about, in that he has a framework for looking at life that almost acts as a forcing function for him encountering these types of opportunities. Uh, While many people will never see them, they're all around us. And until you 
develop this this kind of this this eye for these types of opportunities you're just kind of blissfully unaware but I, I think it can be learned and especially if you can start practicing it from a place of very low risk it can be cultivated and there's a few other takeaways that I wanted to jump into with this episode with Sonny and I, I'm curious which ones stand out for you but if you look at the levers that he pulled the house hacking obviously is massive it's something that we've talked about a lot on this show but what really stood out to me is so many people say well you know it's how could i possibly compete with a full-time investor how could there even be any deals left at this particular point in time what was cool about Sonny's story is he highlighted a built-in advantage for the newbie investor, someone that don't currently have a primary residence and are looking to live in a place of their own. The specific program that he mentioned was actually tied to Wells Fargo. There may be one similar, but it was called the Wells Fargo Home Path, and it gives an edge, as he said, to owner-occupants. Now, that's pretty cool in that if you are looking to do one of these deals and you happen to be, I mean, there are hotbeds in the country where real estate, you just it's really hard to find a deal right and there's others where you could probably have your pick so you could just move to one of those areas or if you want to compete in your more competitive area lean on any advantage you have and if that is I plan on living here and doing a house hack then if you look for a program like this it automatically excludes the more experienced real estate investors which gives you an edge yeah I thought this was a takeaway for me for sure and it sounded I, I love this quote it sounds like I'm a risky person he said but I'm not, right? And and some people might look at him as maybe risky or slightly unusual. And, and he said, everyone has an excuse to not take action. And maybe looking at him as, as risky might be that excuse for that person in his life. But you know what? When I look at his house hack here, they were looking, he said, for over one and a half years before they found this property. And this is somebody in his 20s who bought a 12 bedroom house with four units and like you said he did his research he looked for a year and a half he found this reo bank owned property he found this home path and realized oh wow i've got a chance to swoop in here ahead of these savvy real estate investors and i loved how he said like he lived in one unit him and his wife his in-laws lived in another they renovated these two other units and after a few months, they had them rented for $1,700 a month each. And they were really strict about finding their tenants. So he set up this framework where, okay, this might take an extra month or so to get this rented, but they were really strict about who they put in those units. And you know that pays dividends. There's less turnover. There are fewer issues. It, it just, it, it works. So I just love the framework with which he approaches this. And and obviously this has worked out exceptionally well for him. I think he said that first one, it, the house appraised for $200,000 more than they bought it for. That's unbelievable. And honestly, uh, if you look at the heart of what he did, so getting the property is one thing and then having it not be a failure is, is a separate issue. And once you have the property, if the numbers are what the numbers are, you're looking at an investment, the unknown, the variable, is the tenants, the people that you are living with. If it's a house hack, you are li you're, you're living with other individuals in near proximity. And he said, and this is a quote, all the nightmares of landlording come from tenants. Hmm. So if that's the case, then the, the best skill set that you could develop is how to get great tenants. An ounce of prevention, right? If there's a way that you can screen and make sure, you should have a very high bar for people that you're inviting to live with you for extended periods of time. <laughs> so what does it look like to develop that skill set? That is a question that you can ask and you can get an answer. Maybe it's something that we should explore. Maybe we could have Chad Carson come on the show and talk to us about his tenant screening process, what that actually looks like. But once, what he did is, first of all, he wasn't rushing to get someone in there, but he was making sure that one, he had as many eyes on it as possible by marketing it on Craigslist, on Trulia, on Facebook Marketplace. And then he was trying to get all of those people coming together in the form of an open house. That way his time wasn't constantly tied up in one screening after another screening after another screening. And then he said he had very strict two and a half to one income to rent ratio amount. So you had to meet these kind of these strict income thresholds in order to be in the property because he wants to make sure he doesn't have problems with actually being able to afford the rent once the tenants are in there. I suspect that if you look into this, those are probably commonly uh, banded about numbers that he used, but he only knew about those numbers and what it should be because once he had, you know, keep in mind, this is a guy that had never had a property before, now has a property. He knew that these are the sorts of questions that he should be researching and he didn't want to 
turn this incredible opportunity into a horrible nightmare, right? And I think as you look at it now, this has been a vehicle that has carried him and his wife, I mean, to what, again, 88.92. Right, right. I'm sure it's over 90 at this point, but (laughs) yeah. And I mean, just in summation, he said they are going to buy their freedom from just these two properties alone. He said, you don't need a home run. You just need to make these hard choices and put in the time to research. And in this case, two properties alone are going to get him to financial independence. And to show you that there are other people that are listening to this and doing it, I, I'm so encouraged by this. I got a phone call from uh, my buddy Zach yesterday. We went to college together. And he found our show because I told him about it um, probably almost a year and a half ago and has listen to every episode. So he said, it's kind of weird catching up with you, dude, because I feel like I know what's going on. I know you're at the DMV. Right <laughs> it's weird catching up with you. But um, but he was telling me that as a result of the show, he was pursuing a house hack. And as of yesterday, when, when I talked to him, he his update was, I've purchased a house hack in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's a, it's a huge place that's got a basement that I'll be staying in, renting in the upper rooms. like, And this is entirely due to listening to the show and hearing how other people do it, have done it and how far it has propelled them on their path to financial independence, I'm on my way. And so, I mean, when I look, I actually, I'd like to have him come on the show later on this year because, again, this show is all about that virtuous loop, that virtuous cycle where, you know, we talk about the ideas that other people have done. We incorporate what works for us. Our audience does the same. And then their stories now inspire the next the next set of listeners, you know, and that's how this entire thing spreads. But to put it in perspective, his story, and I don't want to rob him of telling it, was he went to medical field, but he actually chose to join the Navy, and he was able to take advantage of a Navy scholarship to effectively get uh, his medical education, his medical degree for free. I mean, really, this is a guy that has been optimizing this along the way and has been able to get this really awesome lifestyle by design using the principles that have been talked about over the last several years. He's got a fascinating story, so I'd love to have him come on. But just a huge congratulations to him and to the people in the audience that I don't know about right now that have listened to these ideas and are in the process or have already taken action on them. Your feedback really is what drives, it's what makes this show so much fun fun for us to be a part of. All right, Brad, I wanted to go ahead and uh, bring in some feedback, ideas, and questions from the community. I wanted to start with an email that we got from Mike asking whether eliminating credit card debt or investing in Vanguard is the bigger priority. Here's the, here's the email. I'm a 46-year-old high school science teacher with twin five-year-old boys. Since discovering your podcast about a month ago, my whole outlook has changed when it comes to finances. In the past, I was afraid of finances, so I avoided thinking about it. Now, I'm looking at it multiple times a day, looking for ways to squeeze out a little more and trying to gain a little momentum. My biggest challenge is to break my spending habits and dig out of the credit card hamster wheel. But I transferred all my credit card bills to an introductory 0% APR until February 2020. Wow. Look forward to learning more and the continued positive effects. Do you think eliminating the credit card debt is the first way to go, or should I start putting money into a Vanguard account, Mike? So as you guys know, we lean heavily on our in-house experts. I obviously have an initial reaction to this, which I'm sure would be replicated with Brad. But what we did with this voicemail is we sent it over to Big Earn from Early Retirement Now, and he has got back to us with his answer. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Hi, this is Karsten, or Big Earn from the earlyretirementnow.com blog. This is regarding Mike's question about investing versus paying down debt. Normally, paying off the credit card is a number one priority. Uh, If you're paying an interest rate in the double digit percent, you want to pay down the credit card debt because uh, no stock index fund and certainly no individual stock can give you a guaranteed, safe, tax-free return of 169 or 199 percent or whatever your rate might be. Uh, in any given year, if you're lucky, of course, the stock market index might perhaps beat that, but uh, you never want to bet on that. That said, there is this wrinkle in this example with the 0% balance transfer. Uh, just as a side issue, is this really truly 0% or is this 0% interest, but there's a two or three percent one-time fee. So personally, uh, I haven't received any true zero percent balance transfer offers for many years, Uh, but they're usually zero percent interest for a year or 15 months, and then with this additional two or three percent balance transfer fee. Uh, But anyways, uh, at zero percent, I would certainly recommend doing at least a little bit of both, paying down the debt and contributing to your Vanguard account. 
and probably even at two to three percent per year I would still do so especially if you're just starting out to invest the reason is that I like spreading out my equity investments over the longest possible time span and sequence of re uh, return risk is the reason because sometimes you're lucky and you contribute money right at the perfect time and sometimes uh, at the absolute worst time and by spreading out your contributions you average out some of that risk uh, it's essentially diversification it's not diversification across stocks like in a stock index fund but it's diversification across time uh, there are a few caveats uh, first uh, Mike didn't mention how much debt he has and how quickly he can pay it down. So, for example, if he has $100,000 in debt and he's paying down only $1,000 a month, then probably the asset allocation is not his biggest problem right now to worry about. Maybe then raising the savings rate and paying down the debt uh, is the priority number one. Especially because he may then have to rely on rolling his credit card debt so another card in 2020 and then another card in 2021. Maybe there will be an end to the generosity of the card companies uh, and then you're on the hook for 16% interest rates again. So I was working under the assumption that this is a manageable amount of debt and he's wondering if over the next say 10 months he can pay down the debt in five months and then start investing uh, in month six or should he just do half half uh, right from the beginning and again so in that case I would wholeheartedly recommend investing right from the beginning for the reasons I mentioned so sequence of return risk uh, caveat two is that there is a chance that the market might underperform for the foreseeable future that's always a risk but it's a particular and significant risk now that we are 10 plus years into a bull market does he have the stomach to deal with that for example would he have lost his nerve in the fourth quarter last year when the market dropped by almost 20 percent the smart thing would have been to keep investing uh, but i'm sure there are people who threw in the towel and they sold their stocks at the low point in december uh, and then they missed the rally that followed and uh, so investing with leverage makes it even easier to lose your nerve like that so just keep that in mind uh, do you have the stomach that it takes to keep investing even if the market moves against you the way i always motivated my own investing and my own aggressive investing style while still having a mortgage for example uh, back in the old days was that either way things will be fine if the market goes up that's great but even if we have a drop or even a bear market along the way you can use dollar cost averaging essentially sequence of return risk along the way uh, and that worked out really well for me even during 2008 and 9 so I just kept investing and kept grabbing stocks when they were on sale it's a similar philosophy to say what uh, what Jim Collins would say right and one additional comment I like to add is that there are special circumstances where investing becomes even more attractive relative to paying down the debt. Uh, for example, you want to make sure that you capture the entire employer match in your 401k because that, for me personally, was an instant 100% return. Uh, and uh, there's also the great power of the health savings account with the triple tax advantage. Uh, so tax deductibility at the front end, uh, tax-free accumulation and reinvestments, and then also tax-free withdrawals uh, when, when we eventually take the money out. Uh, then in my personal case, uh, I also maxed out the 401k contributions above the employer match because my marginal tax rate was so high while working, 35% uh, federal and 10% in California, so 45% combined uh, marginal tax rate and it's going to be so much lower in retirement uh, so that tax arbitrage alone gives you also a, a great boost to your expected after-tax return uh, so if any of those tax arbitrage situations apply to you and this is not just talking to Mike this is talking to everybody uh, then you could easily justify even keeping some higher interest debt around so even if you have debt at five percent or maybe even a little bit above five percent you may not pay that down any faster than necessary and concentrate on maxing out all those nice sweet tax advantages uh, 
So anyways, hope this was helpful. Uh, best of luck to everybody, and thanks for having me on the show. I love that, Brad. That's a master class in caveats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my gut reaction was, if you have credit card debt, you need to pay it off. Uh, credit card debt is typically hair on fire type debt in my mind. And while we love credit card travel rewards, uh, we are not fans of credit card debt. And um, I think that if you have gotten this this period of time where you can you know get this interest fee like zero percent introductory rates on balance transfers is an insanely powerful tool to pay off your credit card debt more effectively and what i loved about what bigger and talked about is instead of maybe specifically answering this one exact question which i think he did but like even more than that i think he mirrors our own general framework on how life is rarely just like the super black and white there are things that you're probably not thinking about until you've uh, been visible to them so i'm interested in one brad on your gut reaction on Ern's comments but also i have another voicemail that i think adds some more flavor or another question that adds some more flavor to this as well cool well yeah certainly Ern's voicemail was a masterclass and it, it makes you think of all the pertinent items that you need to consider but my initial gut reaction is similar to yours with mike's particular situation and i think it, it does echo what Ern said about hey if you as as mike said if your biggest challenge is to break my spending habits and dig out of credit card hamster wheel you need to work on your savings rate right like something has to fundamentally change in your life in order to get to a point where you're not digging it deeper every month, okay? So I agree with you, Jonathan, in summation that he's got to pay off the credit card debt. He just has to. Now he has, in this case, about a six to seven month reprieve where no interest is due in this, right? This was 0%. We'll assume, we don't know whether he paid a, a balance transfer fee. Like Ern said, obviously you'd love to avoid that if possible. So yeah, but that's kind of moot at this point. He has until February 2020 to keep that 0% APR. So in my estimation, Mike has to do everything possible to get that credit card debt paid off by February of 2020. So that's going to necessitate some life changes. It just simply is. And it sounds like he's well on his way. So I want to add some flavor to this with this second perspective that we got. And this is a question from Rachel on debt payment versus investment. So it's a slightly different frame than what we were talking about with Mike. She says, I know how much we like to, de to debate debt payoff versus investment. So here's a fun one. I bought a new car a year ago at 3.4% interest. I just got a raise. It's going to come out to about $500 a month. Do I push all of that to the principal on my car, shortening the loan time by about two and a half years and saving myself just over $1,000 total? on the life of the loan or just chug along and put the extra towards investments. So I want our audience to think about the framework that Ern talked about for context in our episode 115R. We did an entire episode on how to pay off your debt, our general mindset, but let's apply a combination of that episode framework and what Ern just talked about towards this. Right. So for me, the first thing that jumps to mind as Ern's framework talked about is in this case, Rachel missing out on an employer match with her 401k if she's putting all this extra money to pay off the car because right that is a 100 percent return instantly in most cases right you are you know many of these programs are you put in three percent in your 401k and the employer will match you three percent so that is a 100 percent instant return which is truly unbeatable so that is my very very first question and my follow-up to that or really just to add on to that when i had 168 thousand dollars of student loan debt coming out of school when I started with my employer, the very first thing I did was start my match. You don't walk away from free money, especially on an interest rate that is so favorable. Yep, agreed. The other thing I wanted to talk about and, and maybe do a little bit of contrast here is what's the mindset going into this? So Mike said, I worry about my spending habits. I think one thing that I worry about generally when you're talking to someone that is trying to decide whether or not they're on this path to financial independence or not, whether or not this is a priority, is that I can afford the payments on everything mindset. So if you decide to pay extra and that for you focuses your intensity and allows you to achieve your goals faster, it's hard to put almost a value on that and having that done. But if you're the type of person that is taking that same $500 a month and investing it, and you're doing that, you're doing that first. At the same time you're making your car payment, you are putting that extra $500 a month towards your investments. I 
tend to lean towards the added benefit of getting that money in the market. Um, and, and again, it's one of those know thyself situations, but if you kind of have this metric of good interest versus bad interest versus hair on fire interest, you know, in my mind, below 6%, it looks at least looks reasonable. Over 6% is like, uh, 10% and above is like, wow, this is going to be real. This is going to be working against us. And it's going to be very hard for us to really get a wealth snowball working for us under the weight of that interest. Yeah. And I think in Rachel's case, I, I'm looking at the words that she used to write this. And it sounds like she's going to have this $500 and it's either going to be invested or it's going to be used to pay down principal. So this is not a case where she's in financial difficulty. This sounds like just a truly either or, or maybe frankly, some combination thereof. But yeah, for me, you have 3.4% interest. If it were me, Rachel, if you're asking me my personal opinion, I would put this in investments. I think obviously, like you said, maybe not the greatest idea that that you bought this new car but that's a sunk cost at this point you've made the decision so 3.4 percent i think you can do better in the market or whatever investment you choose so if it were just me i would i would put this in the market now let's talk about just you for a second because we love this car illustration because the other half of this is not so much that you bought a new car once it is what are you going to do next time? And in particular, how long are you going to hold on to this car for? I mean, we've talked about how you can win with cars. We got to realize 99.9990% of the population expects to lose money on cars. And while you know, not all of us are going to immediately start doing a car flip. I think that if you look at what you did is one, what type of car did you buy? Hopefully it's one that's going to last a long time. Are you willing to drive it for a long period of time? Or do you internally feel the need to upgrade every two to three years because you deserve it and that car has kind of gotten old and boring and stale that might that honestly that decision alone is going to be worth far more if you can realize that and you can nip that in the bud and say i bought this car i am going to drive this car forever so if i have payments on this car for five years i plan on driving this car for a minimum of 15 years and the difference that 10 year window of time you take what would normally be a car payment if you're managing the payments and you're upgrading your car every so often you take that money and you throw it in one of these investment accounts over if you do that run that cycle three times so three cars over 45 years one car every 15 years you could just drive it forever a la golden boy but you know <laughs> if you stick with that i mean that's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is, is what we calculated on that as opposed to a person that has that 250 300 a month car payment for their entire investing lifetime yeah and jonathan that was in episode 22 the true cost of car ownership and it's just a neat look at how to approach the mental framework behind buying cars of what a huge difference this truly can be over an investing lifetime. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. All right, well, going back to our mailbag, I think we have some uh, shout outs that we wanna get. First of all, this is our frugal win of the week and this is from Sarah. And Sarah says, my FW OTW, gosh, Brad, we are going to get bumper stickers. We're <laughs> going to do it. I started investing with my HSA and they have VTSAX. Uh -huh. so that was an easy choice. <laughs> That's great. And Brad, you know, I think one of my favorite parts of the show are people sharing with us and with our community how they're winning, right? Nice. How are they winning? And what changes have they made to make that possible? We got this message this morning from Dan and Megan, and they say, Dear Brad and Jonathan, I just want to say thank you for all you've done for the community. To start, I had been nearly $32,000 in debt when I discovered financial independence retire early at 24 years old last summer. Approximately 7,000 of that was credit card debt at about a 20% interest wow. rate. And discovering financial independence is what motivated me to pay off all of the credit card debt. After that, I'd kind of burned myself out and got lazy with chugging away at debt, slowly losing the fire to pay it off. I still had about $25,000 remaining in student loans, and that was as recent as three months ago. And then finally, I discovered the Choose If I podcast. Both my girlfriend and I were invigorated by your show, igniting the fire in me again. Since then, I have gone from $25,000 in student loans to just about $10,000, and the path I'm on predicts it'll be all paid off by about October or November of this year. My girlfriend also decided to start paying off her loans as well ever since landing a job in her field about two months ago. She's applied just under $3,500 a month to those loans. We're dedicated listeners, and we just want to let you know that you've changed our lives for the better. Growing up in a non-financially savvy household instilled negative ways in both of us, we have a totally new outlook on our finances, and we have goals to reach financial independence in the future. I just wanted to reach out and thank you both for that. The change you're bringing to the community and the world is astounding. Thank you so much for everything, Dan and Megan. You can make change in your life in a short to intermediate time period. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really, really cool. 
That is amazing. Megan's paying $3,500 per month to her student loans, and Dan's going to have these things paid off by this year. I mean, that's crazy. Can you imagine the amount of money they can throw to investments when they're done with these things in a very, very short order? So that looks like a nice abbreviated path to FI. I'm very, very impressed. All right, guys. Well, unfortunately, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. There's three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book from Vincent Puglisi, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is just go to choosify.com slash iTunes. Follow the instructions there. Leave us a short written review. Send us an email to feedback at choosify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce a winner on the Friday Roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Kyle. And Kyle says, a fire podcast and community for everyone. The Chooseify podcast is certainly a game changer for anyone looking to upgrade their lives and make wonderful strides in personal finance. But in my opinion, the best part is that these positive changes extend well beyond the show's money's money tips and tricks. The hosts, Jonathan and Brad, are so relatable and incredibly easy to connect with. When you follow their simple path of improving your financial game, the rewarding carryover effect it has in all aspects of your life is the real secret sauce. They host a variety of guests from all walks of life that will give the listener plenty of helpful, actionable steps each week. Beyond the podcast, you can expand your horizons even further and link up with like-minded folks all around the world in the Choose of I local groups on Facebook. I have been a listener and fan since early 2018, and the impact this show has had on my life is truly amazing. Thank you guys so very much. If you enjoy listening to inspiring life stories and appreciate community, take action and subscribe today. Choose FI will bring you all this and so much more. And Kyle says, the fire is spreading, my friends. Taking it out of your mouth, Jonathan. <laughs> I was trying to say it first. No, no, no. It's all Kyle this time. <laughs> the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.